Uh, hi everyone, my name is Manuel. I work um, at Vision for almost eight years now as a solution architect and uh, system engineer. Um, I'm working with Kubernetes and container platforms since roughly 2016. And yeah, so in the next three hours, um, my goal is to give you an overview over the strategies and best practices um, to ensure stable container, op uh, op container operations. Uh, we'll cover the three life cycle phases, so to speak, of an application. The first one is um, the getting stuff deployed phase. Uh, in this phase, we will talk about configuration management, uh, GitOps, deployment optimization, stuff like that. The second phase is the keep stuff running phase. Um, in this part, we will talk about high availability, resilience, and alerting. And then there is the third phase, which I call the, the stale stu uh, scale stuff phase. Um, there we will briefly talk about metrics and scalability. Now my goal is for each of those um, phases um, to address like the biggest challenges uh, they present and um, propose some strategies on how to address them, give some practical tips and so on. Now, unfortunately, I won't be able to go into detail for every one of those topics because that would really take three hours or more. Um, but my goal is to, for every problem, give some hints uh, where to start uh, with research, give some recommendations for tools or, or maybe Kubernetes features you can use. Um, thankfully, the Kubernetes doc is, documentation is very great and detailed if you know where to look. So actually, there's a, like a secret step before, uh, the step zero, and this is the architecture, because before we can deploy our application, we have to build it. And as Dylan BT uh, once said in a talk, um, architecture is the stuff that is hard to change. You know, maybe you know the later in the development cycle, in the life cycle of an application, a bug is um, discovered, the more expensive it is to fix. So if you find it during development, it's very cheap. If you find it during G uh, QA, it's a bit more expensive. If you only find out in production, it's very expensive. This especially holds true for architecture because the architecture fundamentally design, uh, decides how, we, how our application and components are composed and operate uh, and how they work together. So why is this so important? Um, today's container platforms like Kubernetes bring a lot of functionality when, the, when it comes to uh, resilience and scalability, but they really need you, they require you to, to um, look into the details. Your application really needs to be ready to make use of them. It's an entirely different um, environment than the, the physical servers we had in the past. Uh, yeah, and if you build your application as if you were to deploy it on a mainframe, maybe a huge monolith with 15 minute startup times and so on, your, ex, uh, your users and by that you will have a very bad experience. So actually there is um, some, some existing work, so I only have to reference something. There's the 12 factor application manifesto. And this thing, it was, believe it or not, written 13 years ago, so before Kubernetes even existed. And it basically it describes a methodology how to design an application in such a way that is then ready to be deployed on a modern um, platform, which includes our Kubernetes platforms. And yeah, I really I, I cannot stress this enough. If you have an application that uh, will at one point be deployed in a container, read this thing. It's really worth your time. Again, unfortunately, I could talk uh, about an hour about the contents of this uh, manifesto alone. So let's focus on two key points, the horizontal scalability and resilience. Now, horizontal scalability, the name is a bit misleading. This is not only about scalability, but also about resilience. In general, um, achieving horizontal scalability means um, two things. The one thing is that you, in your containers, you only have like one process per container. So that the, the containers should be as small as possible. This has many advantages. Number one is they will, uh, the startup times will be much quicker and we can now more fine-grained scale our application. So we can only scale up the parts that needs that are um, most used and not the whole thing as, a, as, a, as the whole. And the second and probably most important thing is that your application 
should be able to be run in multiple um, instances. So you should be able to have three instances of your application that run in parallel um, that can serve traffic at the same time. This mostly means that the application itself must be stateless, so no state should be stored in memory or uh, on the local disk. Um, instead, you can um, uh, depend on backing services, so state of course goes into the database and um, session information is the, like the number one thing that is in, stored in local memory. This um, can go into a cache like Redis and so on, and for file storage, just use an object storage like S3 or whatever your um, favorite cloud provider has in store. Um, as a rule of thumb, if your application needs sticky sessions on Kubernetes to work properly, you probably did it wrong. Um, other common pitfalls is um, the, that you need some kind of locking mechanisms for parts of the application that cannot run in parallel. Um, for example, um, the database migrations is something. So modern database migration frameworks will handle this pretty well. There is usually a migration table on the database which then will be locked, so only one migration will run at the same time, and there's also like a record um, of what migrations have already run. So if there is no migration to run, it's super quick, so you can just do it on every container startup. Then for um, um, resilience, yes, um, Now, um, those things are probably use, um, uh, helpful for any application, but if you have an application that is uh, deployed on a VM and the database is running locally as well, it's probably not as helpful. But we're talking about Kubernetes here, so nothing is local, everything is attached via the network. And um, funny enough, even today, developers often take like network access to resources as granted, but there are a lot of things that can go wrong. The application should um, account for that. So the first point is um, do some kind of graceful degradation or at least don't crash the application if the database is unavailable, because this will, uh, has, thankfully we're on Kubernetes, so the application will be restarted, but this will not help with the with the situation, it will just cause CPU load. Instead, you reconnect automatically. Um, hopefully, you can you have some kind of circuit circuit breaker mechanism built in either in the application, or if the application does not do it, this you can fake it using Kubernetes. You can just have a health check endpoint that checks the database, and if it fails, um, just mark your pod as not ready, and then there will be no more traffic sent to that container. This will still um, cause error messages for your users, but at least uh, the Kubernetes cluster is not hammering your pod with requests that it cannot answer. Um, yeah. And then while at it, while you're implementing a health check endpoint, you could also um, expose some metrics um, about your application, things like uh, requests and error rates and so on. Again, as a rule of thumb, don't expose things like CPU and RAM usage because this is stuff we can observe from the outside. But if you could expose some information about what subsystem is actually using the memory and, or, and then really like internal metrics like buffer sizes or queue lengths, things like that. We'll actually go over this a bit later. So let's move on. So now the, our application is ready. We have to deploy it. So the mantra today is use declarative configuration, not imperative, not um, install this um, X on machine Y, but instead I want that X is running on Y. Um, yeah, this allows us then to um, leverage the, some declarative configuration management tools. We'll get into that in a second. Um, and so, the, yeah, then the next point is all the configuration um, should, uh, to, um, all the conf deployment configuration today belongs into Git. 
And of course, this has come, become somewhat of a buzzword. GitOps, everyone is doing it, but there's actually um, a buzzword I quite like because there is a lot of value in this one. So by just putting your configuration into Git, we already get a lot of, um, um, a lot of benefits. The first one, and your chief information security officer and your ISO auditor will love this. We now have a very clear audit trail of every configuration change that ever happened to our configuration. We clearly know who did it, what was done, when it was done, and hopefully also why it was done, though the latter you can't enforce proper commit message, but at least um, people have the tools to do so. And by the way, you can also sign, and you should also sign git commits to prove that you were the one who did it. The, the second advantage is we can now um, apply software development methodologies to our configuration. So things like pull or merge requests, peer reviews of changes, CI pipelines for verification, and tagging of stable um, good known versions and so on. And all of this should um, reduce the risk to break stuff when deploying. But if we still break something during a deployment, we can just do a git revert and we're back to the, to the good state. The third advantage is that we can now um, abstract away like the common parts of the configuration. We can package this um, away and now um, achieve a clear separation of the like code of our configuration and the actual configuration. Um, we're getting to that as well. And the last advantage, of course, is when everything is in a Git repository, um, we can automate a lot of stuff. Things like component updates and so on. So let's go into a bit more detail. Um, first of all, um, declarative configuration. Um, actually, this is somewhat of a pet peeve of mine. I am even I'm playing around with the Nix OS, which is an entirely declarative um, operating system. So nothing if something is not defined in your configuration it will not exist on your system you can't just install a global package you have to put it in the configuration which brings a lot of headache but also is really nice so what does this mean in practice um, to start it's very simple um, have your yaml manifests put it in a git repository and have them yaml manifest um, describe your desired state instead of doing kubectl run or kubectl create um, yeah and then of course there are a lot of tools to help with that um, unfortunately with helm we seem to have a, a, a taken a bit step uh, taken a step back uh, with that regards but because with helm you're now instructed to do helm install and version and values and whatnot so we're like back to the imperative style. But uh, fortunately, there are projects like Helm file, which address this, which then allow you to declaratively configure everything of a Helm file, where you say, I want this release, this version of this Helm chart deployed to that namespace with this values, and so on. Um, now, of course, the pro problems we face here are with any software, so somehow we have to bundle it all up and ship it, and, or at least make it so that we can reuse uh, some parts. And historically, and I still hate that it is the, the, still the most popular option, um, the, is um, Helm. I don't know who thought it was a good idea to create inherently structured YAML data using a text-based templating language. I really don't know, but for some reason it stuck around. It's great for debugging. <laughs> Absolutely. I love uh, debugging the indentation of the YAML files and <laughs> yeah, because yeah, what could make YAML any more, um, any more fun? <coughs> For those who don't know, the concept of Helm is you have um, a bunch of templates that have placeholders in them, and then you have a value files which define the values you want to substitute in for those placeholders. And it allows you to reuse the templates, and for every deployment you have then different value files. Uh, fortunately, these days, um, kubectl has customized support built in um, customize, I think it used to be a separate um, project, but now it's part of the Kubernetes CLI. And it allows you to create um, uh, somewhat composable applications. <coughs> 
So how it works is it's basically a preprocessor for the Kubernetes manifests. Um, at the core, you have the customization, which is, again, another YAML file. Um, and it allows you to uh, do things like um, applying a set of common labels or annotations to all the resources or change the target namespace or create secrets or config maps from files and so on. And how you would usually use this is for your application, you have like the base customization, which describes the whole deployment of your application. So the deployments, the services, the ingresses, the persistent volume claim, everything you need. And then for each, but this is only like the, the base template, it's not deployed anywhere. And then for each actual deployment, you have another customization, what's called an overlay. And in this overlay, you will um, re um, reference the base um, customization, and then you can apply patches there. You can, for example, change the target namespace, um, change the host name of your ingress resource, and there's a, even there's a lot of helper to, for example, um, change the image tags of your deployments and so on. Yes. Uh, now, of course, there um, are uh, tons of different tools here. Um, for example, there is Grafana Tanaka, which is basically a wrapper about, um, around JSONnet, which at least allows you to interact with the resources somewhat structured. Um, there is Acorn, who does something completely different. And yeah, at least they don't render YAML in text, um, in plain text, but unfortunately, they are also not as um, widely used as Helm and Customize. So if you want to like, um, you uh, build on the existing um, ecosystem, probably stick with those. Now, the next point um, the drives the concept of the declaration, declarative configuration even further. So instead of manually now applying our manifest to the cluster, because kubectl apply is still imperative somewhat, um, we can use tooling to do that. And the two most commonly used tools for this are Flux CD and Argo CD. I used to prepare the first one because it was much lighter, but nowadays they have converged so much, they're basically the same product. They work uh, by the same principle. So you have some kind of controller operator software that runs on your Kubernetes cluster. You tell it, this is the Git repository with my manifests in it, and then the tool will um, uh, periodically fetch the Git repository and apply all the manifests to the cluster. And the nice thing is this will also take care of deleting resources that are not in your manifests anymore, because this is one of um, actually uh, quite a bit um, Secure, um, security hole that, for example, you have a service account in your manifests, and when you remove it from the manifest and you do CTL, kubectl apply, it, uh, this resource will not be deleted. But with those tools, they keep track of which resources they created, and if it's not in the repository anymore, they will just delete it. And they will also delete, uh, revert any change you do manually on the cluster. And with the Kubernetes API, this is almost real time, so if you change the number of replicas in a deployment, the new pod will not even be started before the tool will revert it. And this is very nice because now with the kubectl apply, maybe I knew that the configuration matched the desired state at one point in the past, but with those tools I know that it, uh, it, this is always true. And of course, now my developers don't need write access to the production environment any, um, anymore because, um, yeah, for, what for? Of course, they might still be able to push to the repository containing the manifests, but there uh, can, of course, then set some review, uh, review rules, um, enforce um, approval by a manager or something like that. And yes, now that we have everything in Git, we can, of course, um, a machine let, uh, let us uh, do our job. And I like this part um, the most. So the um, tools like Renovate um, and the Pandabot. So the idea behind them is that they scan your repository. 
for um, for a manifest of known dependency management things things like um, pom.xml or um, a gem file or requirements txt, uh, txt or a go mod file and it'll scan those files for outdated dependencies and for each outdated dependency it will automatically send you a pull request and now of course this also works with our um, Kubernetes manifests so we can have it renovate our um, the Docker images we use in there and if I remember correctly you can even tell it if you use a tag you can even tell it to substitute the tag for the digest so you don't even you not only you know you have the right tag but the exact version of this tag and this would be a huge pain to manually um, do this because you have to get the digest every time there's a new push to the tag. But uh, using Renovate, you just get the pull request and can approve it. And of course, now that we have proper CI pipelines and we know that change did not break anything, we can also, of course, um, automatically roll out all the patch level releases so I don't have to care about this anymore. Um, a word of warning here, by default, Renovate will not treat YAML files as Kubernetes manifests because it could be anything, so you have to configure this manually. But once you do, it will just work. And it will not only um, renovate your Docker image versions, but it can also renovate the API versions of your Kubernetes manifests for some of them. Uh, yeah, at, at Vision we use this intensively for all our projects, all the software, and I think even to do the OpenShift maintenance by now. Well, maintenance not anymore, but we use it for all our own configuration templates. All right, now, the, the, actually the interesting part, um, operations. So when it comes uh, to running applications on Kubernetes, um, I mean, there are a bazillion um, tutorials in the internet how to deploy your application on Kubernetes. And they all have one thing in common. They describe the happy path and then they finish. So the, our goal is to have production ready deployments. So what does production ready mean? For today, let's define production ready at, as it is resilient against interruptions. In Kubernetes, we have two, basically two um, interruption modes. The first one is the planned interruption. This is when a maintenance happens and the node is drained, for example, or um, a node has to evict some pods because it ran out of memory. And there's the unplanned uh, interruption we all know, the pod crash, the node crash, the data center burned down. <laughs> okay. All right, now, if you only can pay attention for five minutes the whole evening, please do it now, <laughs> because um, um, you would not believe how many times people deploy their stuff to Kubernetes and then complain, oh, now my application is down all the time, and every time you do maintenance, my app is down. Can you do maintenance at 2 a.m. instead of uh, 2, um, 2 um, in the afternoon? But, unfortunate, uh, but fortunately, Kubernetes gives you like a billion tools to work around this. So let's go over them. First of all, um, of course, Kubernetes will restart your containers if they're crashing, but yeah, even systemd can do that. Um, until your container is ready again, I'll, um, um, however, the users will get an error message. However, luckily during the architecture phase, we ensured that um, our application is scalable horizontally, so we can just scale up to multiple replicas and we're done. Um, uh, to any deployment with only one replica is not production ready. So this is quite nice, but uh, what is if, um, if the node died instead of the container? Uh, chances are, and actually with the way the Kubernetes sch scheduler works, chances are quite high that if you start two containers, <laughs> both get started on the same node. So if the node died, we have the same problem again. So the next tool in our tool belt is the anti-affinity rule. This is an attribute you set on your pod, and what it allows you to do is to, um, to ask Kubernetes to spread um, a set of pods across um, um, or across of nodes based on a topology key. Now the topology key is a label on the node. So by default, you can, uh, so the default thing to do is you ask uh, Kubernetes um, to spread your pods based on the topology key host name. 
So this will then cause um, Kubernetes to, if you run five replicas of your application, to spread them evenly, um, to make sure no two pods run on the same host, on the same node. And for the topology key, you can use the host name, you can use the region, you can use the rack, whatever you have available on your cluster. A uh, word of advice here, if your deployment has five replicas and your cluster only three nodes, this will not work. But uh, even there is a work, uh, there's a, um, a feature, so the anti-affinity rules, you have two options, you can say required during scheduling and then there is an uh, what's it called? Preferred, Preferred during scheduling. Thank you. And the latter will try to abide your wishes, but if it's if otherwise the pod could not be scheduled, it will disregard this. So, um, with those two things in place, we are already pretty well um, safeguarded against uh, failures of the containers or the nodes or the data center. Even if no dies, um, there's still pods around and running and serving requests. Um, but what about so planned interruptions? For example, um, the aforementioned maintenance. And actually, we started um, pushing this really to our customers, so our clusters will. Most many of them will be maintained during the day because, um, and. This is exactly why, because we know that with Kubernetes it's trivial to deploy your application in a way that this does not affect you. If it does affect you, we have to look into your deployment. So for maintenance, there is another tool in our tool belt, and this is the pod disruption budget. Now this is a completely separate resource um, in Kubernetes, it's not part of the pod. And what this allows you is to define, for my deployment, it can take um, you can either say, please make sure only one of the pods is not available at any given time, or you can do it the other way around. You can say, if off my deployment, I need at least this number of pods to be available all the time. Now, during maintenance, um, there's um, a step called the, um, the first thing that will happen is that is a node is being drained. So this will mark a Kubernetes node as unschedulable, so no new container can start it, can be started there. And then all the containers on there will be terminated. And by default, it will, if you have, um, for example, if you have two replicas in your um, deployment and the other one is not available because maybe it crashed, um, the node train does not know this and will just terminate your container as well. And now both of your containers are down, your application is offline. But with this um, pod disruption budget, you can then tell it, I need at least one container running. So before terminating the pod on the node that is being drained, Kubernetes will check, okay, for this deployment, is there another pod ready? And if not, it will wait until um, the other pod is ready again and only then terminate the container. Um, again, make sure you don't create um, impossible um, configurations. If your deployment only has three pods and you have a pod disruption budget that's, that says I need at least three available containers, this will not work. And just so you know, on a vision managed cluster, if you do this, we will just disregard your pod disruption budget and boot it from the cluster. Because this will block maintenance. Now, <clears throat> what, um, um, what does it mean a for a container to be ready? This fortunately is a thing that is a bit better, um, how do you say? This one usually works, but just to explain, by default if you do not set um, a readiness probe, um, Kubernetes will regard your container as ready to accept traffic as soon as it is started because it has no way to tell whether the application is actually ready. And if your application is a Java application that takes 15 minute loading char files to memory before it's actually ready to serve requests, this uh, yeah, will lead to error messages. But of course we have a tool there, the readiness probe, you can just um, tell Kubernetes to ping a HTTP endpoint and only if it gets a HTTP 200 response, for example, um, it is ready to serve request. Um, 
Readiness probes are a great um, place to also, for example, ping your database, depending on how your application is built. I mean, this will still lead to error messages, but at least now the container is not receiving traffic while it cannot answer them. Then there is also the liveness probe, and the liveness probe's job is to tell, to communicate to Kubernetes when it's required to restart the container. Now, beginner's mistake, do not ping your database in the liveness probe, because if the, li if the database is down, restarting your container will not fix the database. Um, then there's also resource requests and limits, and I'll not go into detail here, but um, setting them will greatly help the scheduler to uh, make sure the workload is distributed evenly, and to prevent, uh, prevent out-of-memory um, situations and evictions based on resources. As a rule of thumb, your resource requests should match the baseline resource usage your application is using, so this is during idle. And then the limits, of course, as high as you want to go. And last but not least, there is um, monitoring and alerting. So again, with the container platform, monitoring is a lot different than what we are used to in the, like the classic uh, VM or hardware-based uh, application operations. So monitoring is not just how is CPU and RAM usage and is my process running, um, is my process still running? This is not really useful. Especially with uh, Kubernetes, we are not really interested in the health of a single container because we have many of them and if a single container crashes or dies or throws a tantrum, we are not really interested. And paging an on-call engineer um, because of this at 2 a.m. in the morning will only make for grumpy on-call engineers because restarting the container is something Kubernetes can do it on its own. So instead, the metrics we are interested in are how is the number of um, ready containers in proportion to what, we, um, to what we want to have in our deployment. So if our deployment, for example, if we say we have, want to have five replicas and only four are available, even then don't alert right away, but the tools will allow you to set like a Back off time, so only if this does not improve on its own for say 10 minutes only, then page the on call guy. Um, yeah, and with this, um, it really pays off to invest some time into thinking about the service level indicators of your application. And no, the container is running is not the service level indicator. That is a SLI of the container platform, but not of your application. So think about what is the thing that delivers value to my customer and uh, then um, put that into monitoring. Um, in general, there should be like two kinds of alerts or checks. The first one is like the very broad end-to-end -end ones. They can be used um, to like detect the, if something is wrong and page the on-call guy. And then the second ca uh, kind of checks is m the more detailed uh, ones that uh, checks individual components of your architecture. This is then really helpful for finding the root cause and do some, uh, do some troubleshooting. All right. Um, the last part, measure and scale. So um, I think the, the mantra here is um, don't just monitor, but gather insights about your applications. And today um, we thankfully have tools like Prometheus, which make it very easy to gather metrics. Every ap web application can just have a metrics endpoint where you can have any metric you, where you can expose any metric you want. There's no like you have to register this check in your monitoring system beforehand. You can just emit any metric. Um, and this allows you to do um, really interesting stuff. Um, as I said before, you can have re really detailed insights into your application. So not, um, 
not only request rates and error rates, but also the health of individual components. Uh, what, for example, what's all, also a very interesting, if you don't have detailed tracing, you can um, record the average time it takes, for example, for the DB queries. And then over time you can see um, if this changes, uh, if this goes up or down. So you can um, identify um, not only, you then not only realize, oh, the performance of my application has go, gone down, but you can also identify, oh, it's probably this DB <coughs> query that causes this issue. And you can cheat a bit and use this to gather business insights because we're not restricted in the kinds of metrics we expose here. So we can just expose anything, for example, number of shop um, transactions, number of users signed up, anything. And you can just plug it into your um, existing monitoring um, stack. Of course, you could instead um, tell your developer to develop a business analytics inside dashboard into your application. But, you know, um, gathering um, time series data and putting it on a graph, this is somehow what monitoring tools have been doing for the last 100 years. <laughs> and the last bit is um, capacity management. And, um, yeah, I think the previous talk um, already uh, went into this a bit. Um, with the tools we have on Kubernetes, uh, we can do um, <coughs> um, we can automate this um, as well. So on one hand, we have the application auto scaling, which works on your application level. It's quite simple. You tell it a metric to observe and a target level. For example, the beginner metric is CPU usage. You want the target CPU usage to be um, below um, eighty percent. And if it goes above that, it will create a new container um, to, to spread out the load more evenly. Then, of course, there's auto scaling on the cluster level. Um, if you're um, at one point, uh, your application has scaled so much that the cluster is full. And with the today's platforms, you can just tell the cluster to just provision new nodes um, if the existing ones are full. And the nice thing about this, this goes both ways. So the, um, this um, not only can you scale up when you need more power during, um, for example, during office hours, but you can also scale down significantly during, um, for example, uh, during nighttime and so on. And this not only saves you money, but also greatly improves your um, sustainability. Um, um, Your, your ecologic footprint. All right, as a summary, I think the three main points um, account for um, horizontal scalability in your application, manage everything, and by that I mean all the configuration, and use the tools Kubernetes provides you, because otherwise, all the downsides you, uh, Kubernetes bring you, uh, brings you, you will, get, uh, you will get them anyways. So make sure to also use the advantages of it. That's it.